What's the appeal of nostalgia? While video games have always been the biggest influence that introduced people to the world of Pokemon, it's no question that the cards have made a huge impact as well. However, whether it's the games or the cards or any other form of media, there has been just one issue that has persisted the last few years. <clears throat> just one. Gen 1ers. As the times have changed, there is a subset of Pokemon fans that have not. These are the people who think that all designs after the third gen are lazy, the people who paradoxically think that the rivals are too friendly or too unlikable, and the same people that think that Charizard is the strongest Pokemon of all time and Power Creep was created by Big Smogon to keep him down. While I don't think that Gen 1 is the worst generation, I don't think it would be in my top 3 favorite Pokemon generations. However, it makes me wonder, why do people love this generation more than others? I mean, it makes sense why Game Freak loves it because... Yeah, they're going to milk that cow dry. And it makes sense why the Pokemon trading card game, or TCG, announced a special expansion called 151 that features new cards showcasing all 151 of the original Pokemon from Gen 1. So what better way for me to learn more about the mindset of Gen 1ers than to mix the games with the cards? I bought the Pokemon and Scarlet 151 Elite Trainer Box, which comes with 9 booster packs. And instead of using the Pokemon I find on a route, I'm going to instead only use Pokemon that I get from these packs. One pack for each gym, 10 cards for us to hopefully pull a full team. I have to put my heart in the cards for this run, and hopefully this experience will teach me the true meaning of what it means to be a Gen 1-er. This is my Fire Red 151 Booster Lock. So let's quickly cover the rules for this run in case you've never heard of a Nuzlocke. 1. As always, if a Pokemon faints, it's considered gone for good and no longer usable. 2. This is going to be a hardcore Nuzlocke, so no overleveling, no items in battle, and no switching out after defeating an opponent's Pokemon. 3. I can only use Pokemon obtained from the Scarlet and Violet 151 booster packs that I've bought. On top of that, I have to use them as is. That means no evolving Pokemon for later gyms. 4. I have to use a new team, i.e. a new booster pack, for each gym. 5. I have to nickname every Pokemon. And 6. If a Pokemon does faint, I would have to give the card away to a viewer in the Twitch chat. As a heads up, there's a timer for the majority of the run in the top right because I was doing a subathon over on Twitch. If you want a chance to be part of this chaos in the future, make sure to check out the Twitch channel and subscribe here as well. Before I started the run though, I actually opened up one of the packs. This is mostly because I had some fears of a potentially scuffed booster box since the instruction manual inside came with a ripped corner. So after struggling to find out how many cards to move to the front for these packs, I cracked out the first pack and looked at what Pokemon we had to take on Brock. Okay, so. Oh, f***. Growlithe? We have Geodude? Jigglypuff? Stompy Stomp, what a f***ing move name. Victory Bell? Big Air Balloon, that's huge, chat. Primeape? Oh, it's so pretty! Not the best card for our Nuzlocke, but pretty. Hold. Ooh. And finally... Oh, I'm watching. I know I opened this pack to make sure everything seemed kosher. However, I realized that even before I started the game, I felt the childlike wonder of ripping open a pack and wondering what cool stuff was waiting for me. And instead of letting it sit in a box after I pulled them like I did in elementary school, these Pokemon would actually help me take on the Kintonian gyms. I booted up Pokemon Fire Red, named the protagonist after myself, and then named the rival after someone who insults me regularly and fights me on a daily basis. We then get dropped into Pallet Town and Oak gives us our starter Pokemon. Despite the fact that this would not matter even in the slightest, I allowed Twitch chat to choose my starter. We love the illusion of choice over at the Daydreamer Dan streams. However, after chat chose Charmander, I did come up with a theme for all of the Pokemon for this run. Oh, card games! That's cute, dog. How about board games? I take on chat for the first of many times and I have two different thoughts. One, the music low-key slaps despite it being a Game Boy Advance game. And two, Fire Red did not have the physical special split yet for the moves. What's the physical special split? Well, you probably already know that Pokemon have two different stats for damaging moves, the attack stat and the special attack stat. After Gen 4, every move was categorized to either be a physical attack or a special attack. 
Physical moves like Razor Leaf use the attack stat, while special attacks like Giga Drain use the special attack stat. However, prior to Gen 4, the type of the move determined the stat that was being used. That means that all grass type moves use the special attack stat, while types like Normal or Fighting use the attack stat. With this in mind, I started to realize that while the nostalgia was nice before, I started mentally juggling more than I thought. It had been ingrained in my brain that moves like Shadow Ball would use the special stat. But in Fire Red, ghost moves are physical for some reason? Because, you know, you can physically touch ghosts? I don't know, man. So, after defeating chat, I go to the first Pokemon Center and save so that I can bring in the first Booster Lock team to go against Brock. For each Pokemon, I taught them moves that they would be able to learn from the previous level cap, or 6 for Brock, and then gave them a randomized nature and ability if they had multiple choices. However, while I was getting the Pokemon ready to move over to the game, I ran into the second irritating change that I had to remember for the early gens. Growlithe doesn't learn Ember until level 7 in Gen 3 for whatever f***ing reason. In Gen 3, the movesets of nearly every Pokemon was actually trash. Whether it was learning moves way later than they did in later gens, learning weak moves at extremely late levels, or, most importantly for this run, not being able to learn nearly any move before they had a stone evolution, like Victory Bell. These movesets were definitely going to give a headache for this run. Jumping back into the game, I start formulating a team for Brock, grab the Pokedex from Oak, and then go through the Viridian Forest to make our way to Pewter City. I will say the cute little art that some of the locations have, like Viridian Forest, is a nice touch. However, I quickly get pulled away from my appreciation as soon as a wild Weedle poisons my Scrabble the Geodude. That's right, gang. Overworld Poison. In case you didn't know, from Gen 1 to 4, if you had a Pokemon in your party that was poisoned, it would take damage for every 4 steps. Meaning, for this hardcore Nuzlocke in Gen 3, I could easily lose a Pokemon if I'm not careful. After stocking up on antidotes, we finally make it to Pewter City to make it to the first gym leader. The first challenge that nearly every original Pokemon fan had to face to learn the wonders of Pokemon battling. The rock solid trainer, Brock. We start off with Geodude while we send out Jumanji the Victory Bell. While Victory Bell's move pool is terrible this early in the game because of its stone evolution status, he still learns Razor Leaf, which easily one-shots the Geodude with a quad effective attack. I then realize that Brock only has two Pokemon, the second being his ace and Onix. Another Razor Leaf quickly brings down the Colossal Snake with the worst attack stat possible, and with his two Pokemon down, we were now blessed with the first badge of our journey, the Boulder Badge. Seeing how quickly I was able to defeat this gym left me in a strange impasse. On one hand, I was reliving the childhood memories of being able to get my first patch from Brock. However, at the same time, I didn't feel the challenge at all. I started to get scared that this run might be too easy. I grabbed pack number two from the booster box and forgot about my green screen for a second, and then I started to open up the pack to see who we had to take on the second gym. Friend! We have Seal, we have Daduo, we have Dentagruel, we have Golduck, we have Pinsir, ooh. Bill's transfer, this is huge! Pidgey, oh my god, these are not- Are you f***ing kidding me? This pack sucks, dude. Hey, cute! Seal names chat. What about waterboarding? Yeah, we, waterboarding is not a game. Anyway, ignoring the fact that chat is now attempting to commit war crimes, we now had our Pokemon to take on the Cerulean Gym. We are able to grab the running shoes, realize that Tentacle's move pool also sucks, and enter Mount Moon, where I give chat the second chance to choose which fossil I should take. And overwhelmingly, we obviously choose to praise Helix. We find our way to Route 4 and make it to Cerulean City. I mindlessly start drifting off towards the route to the north out of curiosity, but then I realize the folly in my actions when I trigger the rival battle right below Nugget Bridge. This is actually kind of stressful because instead of having my team around the level cap for Misty, my strongest Mon was actually equal to Chats. However, I keep my cool and bring out Monopoly, who's able to take out Pidgeotto with a Confusion and Mega Punch. Azul takes out the Rattata with a few water guns and then takes out his Squirtle with a series of tackles. While Chat still has an Abra in the back, I realize that it doesn't know any moves besides Teleport, so it just sits there as Azul takes it out with Water Gun. With Chat defeated, we then take on Nugget Bridge so that we can say hi to this adorable little Clefairy in this ha- Oh, that's Bill. Huh. Anyway, we save him from his Kafka-esque nightmare, and he gives us the SSN ticket in Vermilion City as a way to say thanks. However, we would have to wait on that, because we first had to head to Cerulean City to face its leader, the tomboyish mermaid, Misty.
We start off the battle with Staryu, and I counter with Operation the Pincer. Operation lands a vice grip, leading to Misty having to burn her super potion on the second turn. Operation is then able to take out Staryu with just two more hits of vice grip. Misty then sends out her eight. Wait. Oh, Misty only has two Pokemon. I mean, I guess we're still early in the game, but still. Anyway, she sends out her ace, a Starmie. While looking at my team, I get surprised that Azul the Vaporeon has a whopping 90 HP. So, even if he took a big hit, he seemed like the best choice to switch in. We also luckily switch in on a Water Pulse, activating Water Absorb and leaving Azul completely unscathed. We, unfortunately, can only hit Starmie with some weak tackles, though. Meanwhile, Azul gets hit by a Crit Swift, leaving him with only 10 HP. So we then have to send in Monopoly to hopefully finish off the Fancy Patrick Star. And with that, we defeat our second gym leader, receiving the Cascade Badge, and then we made our way to the Poke Center so that we could open up our third pack. Okay, we have a Psychic-type energy this time. Okay, so we have a Staryu. Oh, wow, we have a Charmander! Oh, this is not looking good, actually. Oh, that's not great either, chat. Next up... Oh, that's really bad, chat! Next up... Okay, we can... We can work with that. Okay, that's kind of good. Oh, shit. Well, okay, our, one of our reverse hollows is the Kingler, which kind of looks cool. Fing <sighs> kidding. Okay, so in this moment, I was annoyed that we didn't have a big hit of reverse hollow to take on the next gym. However, after stream, I actually found out that this was one of the ultra rare cards in the booster pack. So, hey, that's pretty neat. Alrighty, last one, chat. Oh, wait a second. While Vileplume's an extremely powerful Mon, their moves were a bit lackluster, to say the least. Absorb, Mega Drain, Stun Spore, and Aromatherapy. Suck, suck, stun, stinky. <laughs> I also started to realize that because I had to get new Pokemon after every single gym, this would mean that I would actually have to give myself a little bit of a handicap because of EV training. EVs in Gen 3 are a hidden value that determine the stats a Pokemon gains upon level up. Every wild Pokemon that you encounter gives EV values to any of these stats. For instance, if you defeat a Machop, it gives you one EV point in attack. That would mean a level 50 Pikachu who defeated a bunch of Machops versus a level 50 Pikachu who only used rare candies would have a significant difference in their attack stats. Since I was bringing new Pokemon to each gym, I wouldn't have any EV investments, meaning I'm practically throwing away free stats that could help in later fights. This was a tough obstacle to face, and there was no real answer outside of grinding on lower level Pokemon or buying the expensive vitamins that add EVs as well. Back in game, I now have my next crew of Pokemon and made my way to the SSN. On the way up to the captain's quarters, I run into Chad again, who is raring for a fight. Two rock throws from Tic-Tac-Toe the Onyx takes out their Pidgeotto, and once War Turtle comes out, we bring out Gloomhaven the Vileplume, who stun sports the tortoise and then Mega Drains him with a two-hit kill. Chad's Kadabra, however, seems like the biggest issue. I brought out D&D the Dragonair, expecting her to take a hit. However, I end up being surprised when it goes for Disable. With a free switch in, D&D Dragon Rage and wraps like a barbarian rampaging, taking out the frail Kadabra. The powerful Dragon Rages quickly destroy Chat's Raticate as well. Boy, I can't wait to see how this Pokemon grows though. For us to take on in the f- Oh, there's a theory that we killed it? Damn. After defeating Chat, we run upstairs and rub an old man's back so he can throw up. Yes, this is an actual plot point from the first game. And he gives us cut. Hopefully we washed our hands after we received it. As we say goodbye to the SSN over the horizon, I had to prepare myself for the worst part of the early Pokemon games. A sequence during which most people lose their mind, whether it's 1995, 2004, or even 2023. The Vermilion Gym Puzzle. This infamous puzzle has you go around and check for a random switch amongst 15 garbage cans. Once you find the switch, you then had to find a second switch that is adjacent to the can that you just checked. And if you get it wrong, you have to start the process all over again. So for over two real life minutes, I had to struggle live trying to find this damn switch. Nope, hey, there's a switch in this trash can. Okay, I have a one in two chance, chat. Nope, only trash in here. After I finally find the two switches, I'm able to open the electrical gates and face the head of the gym, the Lightning Lieutenant, Lieutenant Surge. The electrifying fight begins with his Voltorb sent out, with Tic-Tac-Toe the Onyx on our side. 
I expect a Sonic Boom which does a fixed 20 damage no matter what the opponent's defense stats are. However, I get surprised by a Tackle, which does very little to our Sky High defensive Tic-Tac-Toe. This allows Tic-Tac-Toe to dig and take out the Mimic in two hits. Next up was Surge's Pikachu. Knowing that Pikachu knows double team, I was expecting some evasion tactics. However, once again, his Pikachu goes for quick attack, nearly doing nothing to Tic-Tac-Toe. This time, one dig is enough to take out the electric mascot. Finally, it's Surge's Ace, Raichu. His big mean electricity generating machine goes for a double team that I expected from the Pikachu. However, this time, I decide to go for a Screech and somehow still land it even with Raichu's increased evasion, dropping the Raichu's defense by 50%. Tic-Tac-Toe goes underground, but Raichu goes for more double team, so he ends up missing again. Despite Surge's irritating tactics, our second dig attempt lands and we're able to take out the Raichu in one hit because of the defense drop. And with that, Surge is down, we receive our Thunder Badge, and we are ready for the next team of Pokemon who can hopefully help us in the Celadon Gym. Are you f***ing kidding? <laughs> Oof, okay, this is not looking great as a start chat. Anki is, uh, not great. Meowth is also not great. That's dope, but very bad for Erica. Oh, oh, this might be the end chat. God, unless we can get something good. Are you f***ing kidding me? I'm getting the entirety of goddamn Erica's team. Reverse hot. Oh, okay. I'm just going to say it. This card looks f***ing dope as shit. Oh! While this pack started off a little rough, the extremely hype Aerodactyl and Dodrio rounded out the pack and made this train wreck into a bullet train that would hopefully run through Erica's team. We make our way to Celadon, where I am focused to progress the story while chat is doing... chat things. I just read the thing about Mpreg. How is there so many people in this chat who do not know what Mpreg is? I also get lost at one point trying to remember where Celadon is because I forgot to grab the map from Gary's sister at the beginning of the game. So chat tries to roast me on that as well. This is a children's game, Dan. That doesn't mean it's not confusing. I missed half of my help messages. Yeah, I did, okay? You wanna know why I missed half of your messages, Fishy? Because everyone else is talking about male pregnancy in my chat. Anyway, we make our way to Rock Tunnel. I'm able to teach Rock Slide to spite the Aerodactyl, but we run into an optional hiker on the way to the exit. No matter, with just a Geodude, I decide to bring in Barrel the Mankey to low kick it and- Hey, uh... Okay, so if you blinked while I was speeding through the fight, apparently Geodude landed a crit on a level 8 magnitude, basically a base 180 move that even the 4 levels higher Mankey couldn't take. This was the first loss of the run, all because of an optional hiker. F you, Dudley. Soon after the fight, we finally make our way out to Route 10. Outside, I run into a random camper and use Poker the Meowth to take out her Cubone. Of course, because I'm speeding up the fight, I miss that her damn slow poke actually lands another unlucky critical hit on Poker. Uh-oh. Well, after all the rough crits, we finally reach the Lavender Town Poke Center. Luckily, Barrel and Poker weren't essential for the Erica fight, so I dropped them in the newly created graveyard in the PC. In Lavender Town, we enter the Pokemon Tower, an innocuous name for what is, in reality, a seven-story graveyard. On the second floor, though, we run into chat once again. With Spite the Aerodactyl, we're able to take a quick attack and destroy Pidgeotto with a rock slide. Pandemic the Gloom comes out against chat's Wartortle, who we use Absorb on. However, I'm surprised that the AI actually switches Growlithe comes in, so we bring out Locomomo, who defeats the Fiery Hound with a water gun. Chat's Execute follows, so we send out Speed the Dodrio. Execute attempts to put the birds to sleep, only to miss and allow us to have the switch in for free. A peck brings the Execute down low, but Chat follows up with a second Hypnosis that lands in a confusion from... a uh, confusion. We do have Early Bird as an ability, though, so Speed wakes up quickly, and luckily is able to break through the confusion to defeat the Execute. Spike comes out as soon as the Kadabra hits the field, and a single Rock Slide is able to send it right back out. War Turtle returns, meaning that we can go back into Pandemic, who tanks hits while slowly taking out the Turtle with Absorbs. Chat is once again defeated, and then we have to make our way to Celadon, which I forget the direction of once again. Am I going the right way, chat? I was not. Once I found the correct path and avoided all of the trainers, we finally make it to Celadon City. Oh, hey, say hi to the pervert chat. Hi, pervert. We enter the gym and then take on the leader who brings beauty and grace to the field, the nature-loving princess, Erica. Erica leads off with her victory bell, and I bring out Spite the Aerodactyl. I attempt to go for a wing attack, and am thoroughly surprised when it doesn't KO. She's able to land a stun spore, which throws a huge wrench in my plan. Which was just to hit wing attack over and over again. 
I never said it was a deep plan. She uses her Hyper Potion on Victory Bell, but we bring it back down to the red with another wing attack. The following turn, she retorts with a Giga Drain, which does a decent chunk of damage while we were left fully paralyzed. I stay in since Giga Drain only did 31 points of damage. However, how much damage does that do? 31. Okay, so crits in this generation are times two, not times 1.5. Yup, another lovely difference between the early and later gens. While critical hits do 1.5 times as much damage in Gen 4 and beyond, Fire f***ing Red is in Gen 3, meaning that critical hits actually do two times as much damage. So, that 31 points of damage wasn't going to do the max of 46 like I thought, but a whopping 62 points of damage, which was just enough to take out Spite. R.I.P. Spite. Math was your downfall. Regardless, we bring out speed. A peck leaves the Victory Bell at what seems like 1 HP, meaning she lands another Stun Spore on our other speedy flying type. While we were able to take out Victory Bell with just one more peck, Tangela comes right out. Two pecks are able to take out the Tangela, and then finally, Erica's real ace comes out. A level 29, Vile Plume. Her acids don't do much, but our pecs are doing just shy of 50%, so it looks like we have a 3 hit kill. While speed does get sent down to the red zone, we were able to come out victorious with a final peck. Erica hands us the rainbow badge, and we make our way to the Celadon Poke Center to open up our next pack of potential mons. <sighs> Pidgey. Poliwhirl, that's actually pretty good. Kakuna. What is this move? It just says zits. Poliwag. Oof, okay. Yeah, we're bad again, chat. Buck! Oh! Oh! This is a woman. <laughs> oh, Venomoth! Are you f***ing... Okay, are you f***ing me? Praise Helix, I guess. Whoa. Okay, kind of a roller coaster of emotions, but that golem seems like the perfect Pokemon to take on Koga. Also, just as a heads up, the Muck and the Venomoth have the same name because I messed up the nicknaming while I was trying to add them into the game, so don't try and focus on it too much. <laughs> After transferring our next team to the game, I ended my stream for the day. After several hours of playing one of the earliest Pokemon games, I felt strangely overwhelmed by how frustrated I was. While I was flying through the gyms, various gameplay and quality of life changes were showing their age. It made me wonder, are the Gen 1ers wrong? The next day, I put together a team that would hopefully take on some toxic poison types, hit up the Celadon department store for some TMs like Dig and Brick Break, and then finally find the Team Rocket hideout underneath the game corner. On a side note, I just came back from TwitchCon in Las Vegas this year, and I agree with Pokemon. All casinos are evil just beneath the surface. We head deeper into the Rocket hideout, struggle to find the damn elevator key, find it after beating up a guy's Pokemon, and then fight our way to the big boss. However, before revealing who this secret figure could possibly be, I decided to teach chat about why male Torchics have a black dot on their sprites while female Torchics don't. So, male Torchics have a tiny little black dot on their nether regions. The reason why is because it's actually based off a of real life practice when it comes to finding out the sex of a chick. What ends up happening is that they actually squeeze Squeeze, uh, squeeze the chick so that it expels like feces. If you look close enough, the male chicks will have a tiny little bump on their butthole. Pokemon, in order to reflect that similar concept, they put a tiny little black dot on the male Torchix and the female tor Torchix do not. Hey Dan, hope your partner push is going well. Thanks troll. I'm talking about the buttholes of chickens. And that's why I have the educational tag on my streams. Anyway, we fight the leader of Team Rocket, Giovanni. He sends out Onyx against Bachi the Golem, and a signal magnitude sends Onyx back into his ball. Kangaskhan then comes out, and we attempt to start a rollout train, taking out Kanga in three hits. The rollouts continue even when Rhyhorn comes out, so even though he resists our rock-type move, the compounding damage of the fourth and fifth hit of rollout is able to take him out easily, letting us defeat Giovanni for the first of several times. You know what I do respect about Giovanni? He knows when he gets his ass kicked by a 10-year-old that he should just leave. <laughs> We find the self scope in the hideout, which will help us continue to traverse the Pokemon Tower, and then grab the coin case from the recovering gambling addict, which will be important for TMs in the future. We return to Lavender Town to continue up the Pokemon Tower. On the penultimate floor, we reveal the ghost of the vengeful Marowak, 
Twister the Poliwhirl attempts to take it out with a water gun, which does much less than expected. And to make matters worse, the Bonorang's first hit ends up critting against Twister, leaving him only at 24 HP. To make matters even worser, all the Pokemon that we have can't take a powerful ground type move again. I had to weigh out my options, and it seemed like the best way out was unfortunately to sack a Pokemon to allow Sorry the Venomoth to come in. And, out of all the choices, it unfortunately seemed like Port Prophet the Ammonite would have to be the martyr. The Bonorang the following turn easily destroys Port Prophet. All praise Port Prophet. While his sacrifice was powerful, I then realized that it was unnecessary. Can I run away? Well, I level up Twister a little bit more, and then this time around, we quickly defeat the Mother Marowak. Once we're on the top floor, we fight through several rocket grunts in order to save Mr. Fuji, who gives us the Poke Flute that will help us with the Snorlax blocking Route 12. Before that obstacle, however, we had to say goodbye to Port Prophet in the Poke Center, thanking him for his unnecessary sacrifice. A humble prophet indeed. Praise Helix, Helix only dies in our hearts. Wait. After we woke up the Snorlax, I apparently awoken the Larry fandom of the chat as well, who seemed upset that these early gen games don't have a bored old white man to judge them. When do we get to see Larry? Larry isn't in this game, chat. I would f Larry. I'm so tired, chat. Anyway, Fuchsia City. We make it to the gym, where we're ready to take on the poisonous ninja master himself, Koga. He leads with his coughing, facing off against Sari the Venomoth. She's able to land a powerful Psybeam that finishes off the coughing in a single blow. His muck, much bulkier however, only takes about a fourth of his health and damage and sets up acid armor afterwards, doubling its defense stat. Sari though is able to land a sleep powder. While we were able to get his Psybeam off again, he quickly wakes up the following turn and goes for a sludge, which does very little to our bug poison type. We take him out the following turn with a critical Psybeam, as well as the following coughing with one hit and his ace a wheezing in just two. Sorry the Venomoth sweeps the entirety of the ninja's team, and the soul badge is now ours. Before I open up a new pack, I do a quick detour to the Safari Zone, where I get the Surf HM, which will be huge for the future battles to have a powerful water type move that I can teach to multiple Pokemon. On top of that, we also get the Strength HM from the Warden after we give him his teeth back, another decently powerful normal type move. With these two new HMs, I could now open up pack number six. Our first Pokemon on our team is Ghastly. Pettis. Then we have Voltorb, Krabby. Oh shit! Oh shit! Sandslash. Wait, this team is actually kind of goaded. Need a Reno. Ooh, Reverse Hollow Macho. Eh. Remember this face, because this man will be eating his words soon. After choosing a team to hopefully take on some powerful psychic types, I grab the tea from the old woman in the high rise of Celadon so that we can give it to the guard. By the way, get yourself homies like the Saffron guards who all share one cup of tea together. With that, I was now ready to take on the master of psychic Pokemon, Sub- Wait. I f***ing forgot about the Silphco Tower, didn't I? After 13 minutes of teleportation puzzles, grunt fights, and cleaning up the brain juices that were leaking out of my ear, we finally get near the end of the satanic office space, where we run into chat, who, for whatever reason, thinks it's a good idea to do a friendly little Pokemon battle when there's a literal terrorist organization trying to seize control of the building. Thanks, chat. For the battle, I accidentally have George the Paris in front to face Pidgeotto, so I quickly switch in Hungry Hip the Snorlax, who has been carrying us through the grunt fights on the previous levels. However, because I've been relying on this big boy, he actually is out of body slam PPs for this fight. On top of that, Pidgeot lands a critical hit somehow while I try to yawn and put it to sleep. I send in Charades the Mr. Mime instead, and take out the big bird with two hits. Chat sends out Blastoise next, who only loses about a fourth of his health to Charades Magical Leaf. A powerful bite leaves Charades raids on a third though. I send out Risk the Voltorb instead, who surprisingly takes a bite well, and then we're able to land a powerful spark, nearly taking out Blastoise and leaving him paralyzed. A following spark the next turn finishes the job. Growlithe comes out, and I strategize that using charge will increase my special defense, which will hopefully help us tank a following fire type move, but charge is not a one-time special defense increase, right? It's like an overall special defense wait what is there no special defense increase no there is not that gets added in gen 4 
neat. You got crabs the crabby get sent out instead now that risk is at low health. A surf does some decent damage despite crabs' super low special attack stat. While crabs does get burned the following turn, we are still able to take out Growlithe with one more surf. George the Paris comes back out to take on Chat's Execute. He takes out over 50% of the egg's health with a single leech life due to its four times weakness to bug type moves, meaning that it only takes two hits to finish them off. The final Pokemon that Chat sends out is once again the most terrifying. Alakazam. Our entire team is looking rough. I decide to chance taking a big hit with George and click Spore, hoping to put the Alakazam to sleep. To our luck, Alakazam goes for Calm Mind, meaning that Alakazam is sent to sleep while Lil' George lands another Leech Life. However, the light sleeper that he is, Alakazam wakes up the following turn. He goes for Future Sight for some reason, which means that we had two more turns before taking a big hit. George lands another Leech Life, leaving the Alakazam in red. It all came down to this final turn. And if Alakazam would attempt to hit George with anything besides Future Sight, we would be in trouble. Luckily, he doesn't. Yeah, for some reason our rival's Alakazam doesn't have any damaging moves besides Future Sight, so this big scary Mon isn't actually that terrifying. With one final Leech Life, Alakazam goes down. Chat steps aside, and we're finally able to take on the head of Team Rocket a second time. We interrupt Giovanni's conversation, and he challenges us to a battle. He sends out his Nidorino against Mousetrap the Sand Slash. I accidentally click a bit too quickly. Huh, why does that sound familiar? And click on Defense Curl instead of Dig. It does, however, let us tank a four-hit Fury attack. We then use Dig the following turn and one-shot the Nidorino. Giovanni then sends out Kangaskhan. Fearing a big hit, I send out our own big hitter, Hungry Hip, who takes a Tail Whip Defense drop on the switch in. She then goes for it again the following turn, meaning that Snorlax's defenses are now cut in half, while a Brick Break from Hungry only does a bit more than 50%. Kangaskhan then Mega Punches, which does nearly 100 points of damage. Luckily for us, we live to tell the tale and finish off Kangaskhan with just one more Brick Break. Nidoqueen is out next, so we switch in George expecting a double kick. However, once again, we get hit with a tail whip on the switch in. Nidoqueen then goes for a body slam the following turn, which does massive damage, but doesn't do enough to stop George from putting her to sleep with a spore. Mousetrap switches in on the Sleeping Beauty, only for her to wake up once again next turn. However, Nidoqueen goes for Poison Sting. We should be able to take a few of these hits and- Oh f off. Well, we're still able to dig and get a two-hit kill on Nidoqueen. Finally, we had Rhyhorn. Because of the poison, I had to switch out Mousetrap into You Got Crabs. Rhyhorn goes for a Rock Blast, which luckily only hits twice. A four times effective Surf comes out and takes out Rhyhorn in a single hit. Giovanni leaves once again, and we have a chance to talk to the Silphco president, who gives us a Master Ball, which we will never use because of this challenge. And with the threat of Team Rocket gone, we could now take on the Psychic Gym and reach the master of Psychic Pokemon herself, Sabrina. She leads with Kadabra, who sets up a Reflect as Mousetrap goes underground for a dig. While the hit does take him down to red, Sabrina uses her Hyper Potion to heal Kadabra back to full. Mousetrap is then able to take him down right after, with two more digs. However, before it goes down, it uses Future Sight, which makes me wonder if the move still goes through if Kadabra goes down. Sabrina sends out Mr. Mime next, and Sandslash goes for another dig. I get the answer to my Future Sight question as the hit comes out. Unfortunately, for the Fallen Kadabra, Mousetrap is too busy digging a tunnel to get hit. Mr. Mime Mime goes for Barrier, increasing her defense and making Dig a bit more useless. I decide to go for a Slash, hopefully to fish for a crit, but I'm surprised when it goes for Baton Pass. Baton Pass, as the name suggests, passes on any status changes to another Pokemon. That would mean that Sabrina's Venomoth, the one non-psychic type, is able to switch in with now higher defense stats as well. I try to bring in Crabs, thinking that he could take one side beam. However, we end up getting crit and one shot on the switch in. This does give Charades, our own Mr. Mime, a safe switch in to take out Venomoth with a single psychic. Sabrina's Mr. Mime comes out, and we go for another psychic to hopefully take her out before the mirror match lasts too long. However, she literally lives on one, and Sabrina brings the damn clown back up to full with her second Hyper Potion. We Psychic again into Sabrina's Mr. Mime, and we luckily get a crit to speed up this battle. However, when I go for a Magical Leaf the following turn, her Mr. Mime lives on one again. Are you f***ing kidding? Sabrina's Mr. Mime goes for a side beam, blah blah blah, it dies. Please let me move on from this fight. Finally, we have Alakazam. 
Looking at this powerful and fast Pokemon's moveset, I see a potential flaw though that we can take advantage of. Seeing how much the AI likes to use setup moves, I decide to go for Encore, a status move that forces the opposing Pokemon to repeat the last move it used for several turns. This could force Alakazam to spam his calm minds while we take it out with our own moves. The plan works and we switch in Hungry Hip, who lands a huge body slam that kills Sabrina's powerful ace in just one hit. After receiving the Marsh Badge, we grabbed our 7th 151 Booster Pack. Oh, this sucks. Squirtle is... okay. Lickitung is also okay. That's bad. <laughs> Goldbat is also okay. The next one is Leftovers, which is not helpful for us. Persian is once again okay. Ponyta! Are you... what the... are you f***ing kidding? Got to... Let's see it, three, two, one. Okay. While there were no bad Pokemon, we definitely didn't have any good Pokemon to take on Blaine's fire types. Flash fire on Flareon was a good switch in, but Squirtle was the only Pokemon who could even resist a hit. We grab our team, teach Cribbage the Squirtle surf, and start surfing our way across the sea, and then reaching our final destination of Cinnabar Island. Before we can take on the gym, however, we have to explore the ruins of the Pokemon Mansion. I forget about the strange layout of this map, and at one point accidentally went out a one-way exit before I grabbed the key item I needed. I took it very well. But after going through the mansion once again, I find the secret key and enter the Cinnabar Gym. I expertly answer all of the trivia questions and start leveling up my Pokemon to the level cap. No! Anyway, back to the game. We were now ready to take on the hot-headed quiz master, Blaine. He starts off the battle with a Growlithe, so I decide to use Cribbage to set up a Rain Dance to weaken the strength of all of his Fire-type moves. A Fire Blast comes out, which does very little against the Water-type Squirtle in the rain. A single Surf after the setup lets us take Growlithe out. Ponita follows soon after, only to be swept away by the wave again, and Rapidash is sent right out afterwards. Stomp does some decent damage to us, and a Surf from Cribbage does a lot of damage. However, Blaine's Rapidash must be on whatever Sabrina's Mr. Mime was on as well, because it lives literally on a pixel of health. Blaine uses his Hyper Potion, so we set up another Rain Dance and then we switch into Hanabi the Flareon. Rapidash goes for a Bounce, which doesn't do much damage, but it does frustratingly end up paralyzing our Flareon. We go for a Dig, luckily not to get hit by full Para, and then one-shot Rapidash. Blaine's Ace, an Arcanine, comes out and drops our attack with his Intimidate. His takedown drops us below 50%, and our Bite is doing very little. I decide to send out Senate the Persian, who takes the takedown on Switchin. I then switch back into Hanabi, expecting a Fire move from the Arcanine, and call the Fire Blast, activating Hanabi's Flash Fire ability. We land another dig despite being paralyzed. However, Blaine once again gets lucky and Arcanine is left on that pixel of health. Blaine Hyper Potions back up and we get a little damage with a quick attack. I switch in Gomoku the Golbat though, and get two air cutters out due to Arcanine missing a takedown. We're still able to outspeed the dog and take him out with one last bite. Blaine fizzles out, the Volcano Badge burns a hole in our pocket, and we make our way to the Cinnabar Poke Center so that we can rip into our eighth Pokemon booster pack. Execute. Clefairy, Machop, Porygon, Clefable, Dugtrio, Haunter, Poliwhirl. That's pretty f***ing hype. <gasps> we win. I make my way back to Viridian City to take on the final gym. It was time to take on the head of Team Rocket on his own turf. The self-proclaimed strongest trainer, Giovanni. His starting Pokemon is Rhyhorn, while ours is Bop at the Poliwhirl. We go for a Brick Break, which does surprisingly less than I expect. Rhyhorn does drop our speed with a scary face, but a Surf takes out the Rhyhorn the next turn. Giovanni then sends out his Doug Trio, whose Earthquake does a bit more than a third to Bop its health. However, our Surf once again takes out Giovanni's Mon in a single hit. Nidoqueen is then sent out an Earthquake, but Bop it continues to hold on. A Surf does take Nidoqueen down low, but we opt to switch into Yeti to hopefully avoid another Earthquake, which we do. An Ice Beam then takes out the rest of Nidoqueen's health, and then Giovanni sends out his second Rhyhorn. Fearful of a Rock-type move though, I decide to switch in Balderdash, our own Dugtrio. We get hit with another scary face on switch in, and because our only Ground-type move is Magnitude, we roll the Metaphorical Dice and unfortunately only get a Magnitude 5, which does a measly base 30 damage and does very little to Rhyhorn. 
Dugtrio gets hit with another scary face, making him even slower. However, Balderdash still outspeeds, and we're able to take him out with a magnitude 8 this time around. Giovanni's ace, Nidoking, comes out, shaking the ground with another powerful earthquake, and leaving Balderdash at a third of his health. Balderdash retorts with the magnitude 7, but comes up a little short from the one shot. Yet he gets switched in while Giovanni heals Nidoking back up to full. No matter though, because the ice beam faints the Nidoking, finishing off Giovanni. And just like that, we receive the final badge, the Earth Badge, and are done with the gyms of the Kanto region. However, as we know, we still had one hurdle that we had to face in order to beat Fire Red. The Elite Four at Indigo Plateau. We had one last pack to open, and these were going to be the Mons we used for Victory Road. I opened it up and showed Chat the final roster to help us make the journey to the final showdown. Just a little guy. Two just a little guys, that's okay. Okay, another just a little guy, that's fine. They're all just little guys. Oh, that's also just a little guy. Okay, that's four little guys, that's fine because this is Erica, she doesn't count. That's not a little guy. Oh wait, that's also a huge guy. I mean a huge gal in this case. Oh, never mind. we're back into just a little guy territory chat. Okay, once again, we're in just a little guy. Three. Two, one. <gasps> Look at Mama go. While I was excited by some of the options that this final pack gave us, this was the end of day two of the booster lock. After playing through more of the region, I started to realize that my frustrations were starting to fade. Sure, I was still annoyed by things like the critical hit multiplier and the ever-present crappy movesets, but it felt more manageable than the previous day. At the beginning of day 3, I searched through my TMs to see if I could find anything to teach my Pokemon to get them ready for the journey to Indigo Plateau. Snatch. Why do people keep putting ellipses in the chat? Uh, let's say you had a Pokemon that was about to heal itself up using synthesis, and then you take away the effects of that synthesis so that you can heal up your Garchomp instead. I don't know if Garchomp learned Snatch. Can someone Google Garchomp Snatch? <laughs> for me please and let me know what comes up please don't actually google that we make our way east towards the indigo plateau but we're stopped in our place by our rival chat once more for our pen ultimate battle together he sends out pidgeot against my magneton connect four who ends up taking him out with a super effective spark when he sends out his growlith we counter by sending in solitaire the needle queen while we do take a flame wheel on switchin solitaire and her newly taught earthquake is able to one shot the fire puppy Alakazam comes out, and we send Connect 4 back out, only to see that Alakazam is trying to set up Calm Minds again. Instead of a special attacker, I double into Candyland the Kangaskhan, and luckily get a free switch in because he attempts to go for a Disable. We fake out Alakazam for some free damage, nearly taking him out. A Dizzy Punch right after defeats the threatening Mon. Rhyhorn comes out, and I attempt to go for a reversal, which does very little. Candyland, however, actually knows Surf because we needed to traverse the Indigo Plateau, so I just go for Surf and finish off the Rhyhorn with its terrible special defense and four times weakness to water. Execute is then sent out, who goes down in two dizzy punches after an unfortunate sleep powder miss. This leaves chat with only their ace, Blastoise. A crit dizzy punch comes out, taking Blastoise down to below half. I then switch in Gartenbau the Bulbasaur, who I hope can take whatever water move this monstrous and powerful Blastoise is about to throw at us. Wait, yup. The rival's Blastoise only knows Water Gun. With Gartenbau now out, Blastoise goes for a bite, which actually does some decent damage. However, using both Synthesis and Razor Leafs lets us take out the Blastoise. With that, Chat is defeated once more, and we can start making our way through the gauntlet of guards who check our badges. One by one, we move through the checkpoints, and I can't help but reflect on the journey so far. The entire run has been a strange spectrum, from extremely easy to extremely unlucky. A series of events that caught me off guard left and right. And while it was surprising, there was a part of me that still enjoyed it. Being able to go through the towns that I had not experienced in literal decades was refreshing. As much as I enjoyed the newer Pokemon games and designs, there was something nice about going back to the basics. Being able to use the original 151 Pokemon, opening up the Pokemon cards to be mesmerized by their designs, and experiencing Pokemon in Kanto in a new light. Yes, the early gens are annoying and janky, but they still had won a kid over nearly 20 years ago to the point where he's making an hour-long video about a silly challenge run. 
So, with this newfound respect of the past, I decided that for the Elite Four, we should pay homage to the journey that we've been on so far by being able to choose any Pokemon still alive from any of the packs to be part of our final team. From Brock to Giovanni, we had some amazing Mons. Now, it was time to put them to the final test. At the last minute, I made a decision that I would soon choose to regret. I decided that it was too easy to bring along Yeti. So, for the final team, we were bringing Gathering the Gyarados, Connect Four the Magneton, Solitaire the Nidoqueen, Bocce the Golem, Hungry Hip the Snorlax, and Hanabi the Flareon. Nervous, I took on the Elite Four. We meet Lorelei in her ice-cold stare first. Dugong comes out and we send out Connect Four. A single spark is enough to take out Dugon to red, but no kill. However, Lorelai burns one of her full restores to heal Dugon back up to full, so we're able to just bring her back down to red again and then finish her off the following turn. Cloyster is sent out, but its mad high defense doesn't help him this generation with Connect's spark, which secures a one-shot kill. Lorelai sends out Slowbro, and once again, yet another one-shot feint. Lapras comes out next, and this time Spark only does about 60%, but lucky for us, we get the Para, full paralyzing the Lapras first turn. I'm surprised that Lorelai doesn't use one of her full restores, so we end up taking out Lapras with another Spark. Lorelai sends out her final Pokemon, Jinx. Despite the fact that we land a Spark, Jinx lands a lovely kiss that puts Connect 4 to sleep. I decide to send out Bocce, but he gets hit by a huge ice punch that not only takes us below health, but freezes him in place. I decide to send out Hungry Hip, with his thick fat ability, which would have the damage of ice and fire type moves. Ice Punch still does some damage, but unfortunately, Jinx outspeeds Hungry Hip and lands another lovely kiss, putting him to sleep. While I thought we could wait out the sleep, Jinx of course uses Attract on him as well, like a f***ed up version of Sleeping Beauty. I send out Hanabi instead, who's one of the girlies, so Attract shouldn't work on her. However, once again, Jinx is spreading those lovely kisses to the entire team and puts Hanabi to sleep. I decide to stay in and tank the ice punches over and over again. Until finally, Hanabi is able to wake out and take out the terrible kissing Jinx with a single flamethrower, leading to our victory against Lorelei. That means we are ready to take on the second member of the Elite Four, the fighting type specialist, Bruno. Bruno starts off with one of his two Onyxes while we counter with Gathering the Gyarados. A single surf is all it takes to take him out. Hitmonchan comes out right after, and Gathering goes for a strength to take out about 50% of his health. However, Hitmonchan drops a Rock Tomb that does some decent damage and gives us a speed drop as well. Another strength is able to take out Hitmonchan, so Bruno sends out his Machamp, the most threatening member of his team. Because of the speed drop and the damage he's already taken, I decided that switching in solitaire could be helpful. However, I was terrified once I saw that a Bulk Up came out. Bulk Up is a move that increases the attack and defense of a Pokemon by 50%, so this Machamp could end up sweeping if we didn't take it out quick enough. I try to go for an Aerial Ace, but it does very little as Machamp goes for another Bulk Up. I bring in Connect 4, our special attacker, but then get hit by a scary face that slows down our defensive electric type. I think we should be able to take a hit, but Machop ends up landing a critical hit cross chop on our steel type, taking out Connect 4 in a single hit. Gathering comes out next, whose Intimidate does mitigate some of that high attack on the opposing Machamp. We do surf for some special damage, but only do around about a third of his health. Machamp continues to set up another bulk up, and of course the Citrus Berry brings him back to around 50%. Surf doesn't kill the next turn, and then Machamp scary faces to slow down Gathering. All of our hard work is then thrown down the drain as soon as I see that Bruno full restores Machamp back to full. We attempt more surfs for very little damage, and Cross Chop, even resisted, does a whopping 90 damage. We're able to bring him back down to less than 50, but we had to switch in Solitaire to hopefully not lose Gathering. However, we of course get critically hit, and Solitaire takes nearly 160 points of damage. Poison Point does activate, so that's a little plus. Solitaire also luckily outspeeds, so we go for an Aerial Ace. You what?! And Machamp lives on just a thread. This allows him to come out with one more cross chop to finish off Solitaire. Hungry Hip is able to come out to see the poison take out Machamp. Hitmonlee comes out next, so I double back into Gathering so that we can get an Intimidate attack drop once again. I assume a Brick Break is coming out since Hungry Hip is a normal type, so Gathering should be able to tank a hit, especially after the attack drop. We resist this, unless it crits. Are you f***ing kidding me? Another crit? We are now in a terrible situation. Hanabi has to be sent out to take another Brick Break. They live the hit along with a following Mega Kick and Overheat to nearly one-shot the Hitmonlee. 
We switch into Hungry Hip to hopefully tank a hit, but get surprised when Bruno also switches out into a second Onyx. He goes for an Earthquake, which does very little, and a two-hit Brick Break is able to secure a kill from Hungry Hip. Hitmonlee comes back out and Bruno uses his full restore to bring the Mon back to full. A body slam from Hungry Hip does a bunch of damage, but once again, Hitmonlee has an invisible focus ban on. It all comes down to this final turn, seeing if Hungry Hip can take one more Brick Break. And he does. One last body slam and we come out of the murderous run of Pokemon with just four members of our team. We now are entering the room of the third Elite Four member, the terrifying ghost specialist, Agatha. With only two thirds of our team left, one of which was a normal type who would struggle to hit ghost types at all, I was going in with very little confidence. She leads off with one of her two Gengar, while we send out Hanabi. Agatha starts off by setting off double teams to increase Gengar's evasion. Hanabi is able to land a bite, putting Gengar to about 25%, but ends up getting hit by Confuse Ray the following turn. We of course hit ourselves right off the bat, so I decide to switch into Hungry Hip, who doesn't take anything from a Shadow Punch that tries to come out. However, she once again goes for Confuse Ray. While we don't hit ourselves in Confusion, we do end up missing the move. Gengar sets up yet another double team and lands another Confuse Ray. Hungry Hip misses a few times until we finally land a rollout that puts Gengar into the red. Agatha, of course, uses her first full restore, but Hungry Hip is able to snap out of confusion and land another hit on Gengar. The following turn, though, we had much less luck and hit ourselves once again in confusion. I decide to bring in Gathering, whose Intimidate attack drop would hopefully help with Gengar's stab ghost type moves. Remember, it's physical this gen. But instead, I'm surprised by a Toxic that lands onto Gathering. Gengar drops another Confuse Ray, leading to Gathering hitting himself the following turn. We switch back into Hungry Hip to hopefully avoid another hit, but the despicable ghost just goes for yet another double team. When we don't hit ourselves, we miss our rollouts. This goes on for way too long, and it gets to the point where Hungry Hip actually ends up hitting himself not once, not twice, not thrice, but four times in confusion back to back. I finally decide to switch in Bocce, but the only move that we have to attempt to hit her is a normally 80% accuracy Rock Blast. Because of the constant double teams though, the chance of landing Rock Blast had dropped down from 80% to less than 30. It takes four turns for us to finally land a hit and take out the Gengar. Arbok comes out afterwards, dropping Bachi's attack, and an Iron Tail leaves him in the red. Despite all of this, a single Earthquake is strong enough to defeat Arbok. Agatha follows up with her Gold Bat, who we switch in Hanabi for. A bite in an Air Cutter does leave her around 60 HP, but our own Flamethrower leaves the Gold Bat in the red. While one more Air Cutter does leave Hanabi looking worse for wear, the next Flamethrower takes the Bat out of the skies we still had another Gengar to deal with. I decide to switch in Gathering to hopefully drop the attack stat again, but Gathering is still poisoned by that Toxic from before. While we do take a Shadow Ball and Sludge Bomb, the Surf is not enough to take out Gengar even to 50%. Gathering falls. We still had three Pokemon, all in the red, and Agatha still had two ghosts looking lively, ironically. Hungry Hip comes out, only to be hit by a Hypnosis, and then Sludge Bomb to just 10 HP. I was fully ready to lose Hungry Hip to this Gengar. However, against all odds... What?! Hungry Hip not only woke up, but a Quick Claw proc allowed us to get one last yawn in before falling to a Sludge Bomb. O7's oh. in the comments for Hungry Hip for this extremely hype moment. Bachi comes out, and I had no hope that it would be able to take another hit from the Gengar. However, once again, against all odds, the Gengar's gonna fall asleep, so that's something, right? Wait, what? Bachi only takes 16 points of damage from a Shadow Ball. This allows her to get a three-hit Rock Blast off, taking out the Speedy Ghost Menace, and that's when I realized, oh my god, the attack drop! That's right, the Intimidate attack drop allowed Bachi to take the Shadow Ball hit. Gathering's influence lived on, even if he didn't. All that was left was one last Haunter. I hold my breath as I click on Rock Blast. And, to my surprise... Oh! We f***ing win these. We've defeated the third Elite Four member, meaning we only had Lance and the champion fight left. Our team was just Hanabi and Bachi, so those odds did not look well. However, I never say never. 
I tried to come up with a strategy to hopefully take on Lance, and I go in guns blazing. Lance leads with Gyarados, whose Intimidate already severely limits Bachi. I instantly switch in Hanabi, who gets hit by a fixed damage Dragon Rage. We switch back into Bachi, who takes another Dragon Rage. Our plan is to Rock Blast the Flying Water type, However, those plans instantly get thrown into the trash once we get a flinch from Gyarados's bite. Another Dragon Rage puts Bachi below 50%. While we're able to take out Gyarados with a three-hit Rock Blast once again, this time with a crit to boot, Lance sends out his first Dragonair. Bachi Earthquakes, doing some great damage and causing Lance to burn one of his full restores. We Earthquake again and see our good friend one pixel of health, meaning that Bachi is hit once more by a Dragon Rage and leaving him at 46 HP. Bachi is able to finish off the Dragonair with one more Earthquake, but the second Dragonair comes out with an Outrage, taking out Bachi once and for all. 07s for Bachi. Hanabi is the last Mon of our team, and despite our best efforts to take out the Dragonair after it paralyzes her, Lance's Aerodactyl defeats Hanabi with two ancient powers. And just like that, our Nuzlocke was cut off right at the penultimate battle. Despite the best efforts of Bachi, Gathering, Hanabi, Hungry Hip, and the rest of the team, we had just come up a little short. However, despite all of the frustration and irritation I had towards the early generation game mechanics, I still felt something after my loss. Determination. And no, I'm not trying to make an Undertale reference, but it just happened to turn into one by mistake. I felt the same nostalgic determination I felt when I first played the Pokemon games and struggled to fight the gym leaders. While I did lose the challenge, I wanted to still show that I could become the champion of Kanto. I also wasn't going to restart the entire run with new cards because I'm not f***ing paying another 60 bucks for cards, dude. So I came up with one last audible. I'm gonna do one more attempt, only one more attempt, but with different Pokemon. None of the Pokemon that I used. If we bring in a second team, maybe they can make it up for Bocce. I sat down at the PC and I started to formulate a new team. And this time, I would allow myself to bring Yeti. For the second run, I decided to bring Handyland the Kangaskhan. A late entry, but one that could bring the bulk and pain that we needed. Azul the Vaporeon. Last seen taking on Misty, he brings an immunity for water and has a respectable special stat and move pool. Gomoku the Gold Bat. After defeating Blaine's Arcanine, this surprisingly bulky bat could help us take a few hits. Charades the Mr. Mine. A laughing stock at first, she has shown her true colors as both a utility mon and a special attack powerhouse. Balderdash, the Doug Trio. Fast and powerful, he could be the ace up our sleeves to take out some of the more threatening mons we've seen so far. And finally, of course, Yeti, the Articuno. Need I say more? I walk in once again, ready to take on the Elite Four. New Pokemon, new moves, and a new drive to be the very best. We start off with Lorelei once again. Charades comes out against her Dugong. We one-shot it with a critical hit Thunderbolt. We attempt the same on Lapras, who's left right below 50%. A body slam from Lapras does some decent damage and leaves Charades paralyzed, unfortunately, and her Citrus Berry then procs. Another Thunderbolt is able to land despite the para, but we once again see the little asshole known as One Pixel of Health. I switch in Yeti, and Lorelei opts to use her full restore on Lapras. While a fly does do a little bit of damage, we see that Lapras is doing her best Gengar impression with a Confuse Ray. Frustrated, I switch in Candyland. A fake out and brick break once again leaves Lapras skirting death, allowing her to confuse Ray once more. Yeti switches in again, takes an ice beam very well, and takes out Lapras with a fly. We toxic the Cloyster as it comes in, and even though it sets up spikes on our side, we use fly and ice beam to take Cloyster out in three turns. We do the same tactic with Slowbro, but we take him down to about 50% before he's able to land a yawn on Yeti. I then switch in Azul, who does take some damage from the spikes that we've set, but instantly regains all of that lost HP because Slowbro attempts to use Surf. We Shadow Ball Slowbro twice, and then switch in Yeti after being yawned. For some reason, Lorelei opts to double yawn, so Azul comes back out just to get hit by the damn triple yawn. Woo, I f***ing love this AI. At this point, I'm tired of these yawns, ironically, so I Shadow Ball to take out the Slowbro. Finally, we had to deal with Jinx, with our now sleeping Azul. I switch in Gomoku, expecting a lovely kiss or attract, but to my surprise, Jinx actually goes for Ice Punch this time around, dealing huge damage to Gomoku. I double switch into Yeti, we're able to Toxic and Fly to take out the Jinx super quickly this time around. Lorelei, attempt to, finished. Now time to deal with Bruno and his bulking Machamp once more. 
Onyx leads off again, but we have Azul and his Surfs to take out the Onyx in one. Hitmonchan comes right out, so we switch into Yeti, who dodges a Sky Uppercut and sets up a Reflect to reduce all the physical damage. Even after a speed drop, we still outspeed, and we're able to one-shot the Hitmonchan with Fly. Bruno sends out the terrifying Machamp once again. We unfortunately don't get the one-shot this time around with Fly, so Machamp takes the chance to bulk up, and has his Citrus Berry proc to heal him back up. I set up a Reflect again, but then I'm surprised when a Scary Face comes out. But the surprises keep coming when I see that he goes for Cross Chop instead, when I tried to switch in Candyland. I had to double back into Gomoku, who quad resists the fighting type move, but still gets crit to lose a third of her health. An air cutter is just shy of taking out Machamp, but we luckily dodge a rock tomb. Bruno full restores Machamp back to tip top shape, and our moves are doing very little now against the plus one defense fighting type. I finally switch in our special attacker, Charades, who only gets hit by a scary face on the switch in, and we retort with a psychic that takes out Machamp. Hitmonlee comes out and mega kicks Charades, which does way more than expected. However, we're still able to one shot Hitmonlee as well with a Psychic. To finish off the battle, we take out Bruno's second Onyx with Azul Surf once again. A much cleaner and less tragic Bruno this time around. For our second time against Agatha, I was still scared about the status inflicting ghosts. However, we had our own little trick ready for her. We face off and lead with Gomoku. Gomoku then goes for Taunt, a status move that makes it so that the opposing Pokemon can't use their own status moves. That means no Confuse Rays, no Double Teams, and no Toxic from our little annoying friend here. However, this time around, Agatha actually chooses the one damaging move. Gomoku Shadow Balls, which nearly kills. Agatha burns one of her full restores, so that allows Gomoku to shoot off two more Shadow Balls and take out the first Gengar. She then sends out Haunter. Fun fact, if you outspeed and taunt this Haunter, it literally can't do anything. This allowed me to send in charades freely and psychic the Haunter out of existence. Golbet and Arbok follow after, only to both meet the same fate with two more psychics. We were only left with Agatha's second Gengar. We switch into Zul, who takes a hit well despite being crit, but unfortunately he's put to sleep the following turn with a hypnosis. I instantly switch out into Yeti, but follows Azul's influence and also is hit by a hypnosis. I decide to stay in to see if we could get a cheeky early wake up, but with no luck, we decide to go back into charades. However, to my luck, Charades gets poisoned on switch-in by a sludge bomb. Candyland comes into a shadow ball, which doesn't affect her at all, and then I bring out Gomoku, fully expecting sludge bomb, but instead get hit with yet another hypnosis. By the way, hypnosis has an accuracy of 60%, so the fact that three of these motherfuckers landed is honestly Vegas-worthy, Agatha. Maybe go there and hit the slots instead of terrorizing 10-year-olds with that luck. We had no safe switch-ins once again, so I decided that sacking Gomoku could help minimize the amount of damage the rest of the team takes. So, I click on Shadow Ball, fully expecting Gomoku to continue slumbering. Until... Choice that we can do- WHAT?! Oh! I don't think this will kill! Oh my god, I can't believe he woke up last turn! This is perfect though, chat. WHAT?! I got the invisible focus band this time. While we still needed the safe switch in, it was wild to see Gomoku give one last hit against Gengar. I bring out Balderdash right after to attempt to take out Gengar with Thief, only to get a low roll the second time. Gengar is back on his hypnosis bullshit, so I switch in charades while Agatha full restores Gengar. I go for a Hail Mary by clicking Encore, hoping to force Gengar to attempt hypnosis again against my already poisoned charades. And to my surprise... Oh! We outspeed! Yes! With that, we were able to get a psychic off and defeat Agatha's final Pokemon. We were back at Lance, and this time, with only one loss, as opposed to four. We walked up to challenge him, and ready to see what he had in store. His Gyarados starts off the fight, but we lead with Charades, who's able to one-shot the Leviathan with a Thunderbolt. Aerodactyl comes out right after and does decent damage with an Ancient Power, but we get a critical Thunderbolt to take out the Ancient Beast. Lance decides to bring out the big guns early and has Dragonite come out. We instantly switch in Yeti, our Dragon Killer, who takes a wing attack and then outspeeds with a four times effective Ice Beam. All that's left is two Dragonairs, which we easily sweep with two more Ice Beams. With that, the Elite Four was defeated, but we had one last opponent. My rival since the very beginning, chat. As I walk into the final room, I could feel my palms sweating. It was time to take on our rival one last time. 
Chat and I both send out our birds, Pidgeot and Yeti the Articuno. We start off with setting up Reflect, minimizing the damage we take from Aerial Ace. A nice beam from Yeti quickly takes out the Pidgeot. Rhydon comes out right after, so we send in Candyland, who expertly dodges his following Rock Tomb. With one fake out and a few Brick Breaks, we get Chat to use one of their full restores. Seeing how little the Brick Breaks were doing, we switch in Azul. We take an Earthquake, and then drown the four times weak Rhydon with a single Surf. Executor waddles out, so Yeti hits the field once again. He's able to hit a Sleep Powder on the switch in, but Yeti persists. Despite sleeping five whole turns and getting put into the yellow, we fly and take Executor out to half only for Yeti to be hit once more with a Sleep Powder. Yeti gets hit by an Egg Bomb, leaving them at 25 HP, one hit away from death. However, when all hope seemed lost... Wake up! YES! WE f WIN THESE! Yeti is able to wake up when the time is right and take out Executor with one more fly. Next up is Arcanine. Balderdash comes out, who does take some damage from an extreme speed. He is able to outspeed the Arcanine the next turn, but an Earthquake is just shy of taking him out. Arcanine goes for a powerful flamethrower, and Balderdash, unfortunately, goes down. Charades comes out, and after taking an extreme speed, goes for a psychic that, once a f again, leaves a nut hair of health on Arcanine. Chat does use their next full restore, which allows us to do more damage with Psychic. We take one more extreme speed, and history once again repeats itself. 1 HP, full restore, Psychic. However, I bring in Candyland once Arcanine is at 50%. We fake out and then Dizzy Punch to finally finish this never-ending story. Our second to last obstacle is Alakazam. Candyland's Dizzy Punch connects, which nearly takes him out, but he's able to retort with a powerful psychic. Chat, however, uses their full restore, which allows us to outspeed Alakazam and land two more Dizzy Punches to secure the feint. Finally, we have our rival starter, the Squirtle that had become a Blastoise. I wasn't sure if Chat might go for a bite again, like our previous fight, so I decided to have a potential sack. And despite everything, there was only one Pokemon that I thought would be a good choice. Goodbye, Yeti, and thank you for the carry. We switch in charades, but even a Thunderbolt from this icon is not enough to get the kill as she goes down. And finally, I bring in Azul. Nerves were high. Blastoise, however, messes up and goes for a Hydro Pump, which brings Azul back to nearly full health. We go for Shadow Ball, which doesn't do much damage, but does drop his special defense. I weigh my options, and ultimately, I click on Surf. Why? Well, Vaporeon's attack stat isn't great, so Shadow Ball wouldn't do much damage. So, with a stab water move from Vaporeon's higher special attack stat, along with the special defense drop, I thought that Surf might just do enough. And, to my benefit and surprise, Blastoise goes for Rain Dance, which powers up our Surf. And with that, we defeated Chat and became the Pokemon Champion. Professor Oak leads us up to the Hall of Fame, and we get to see the team that helped us beat Fire Red both in-game and in real life. I get to see the Fire Red credits for the very first time, and I finally seem to understand why people love these early games. It's not because these games were harder, or that the designs were cooler, or that the gameplay mechanics are better. God, definitely not that last one. But it's the memories that we made and the stories that we got to share that bring us back. The designs of the original 151 were what many people grew up with. Blue had been the driving force for us to prove ourselves. And Charizard, no matter how overhyped, was still the Pokemon that helped hundreds of thousands of kids take on countless battles. While nostalgia is not always the best and can cause us to view the past with rose-colored glasses, it does show us the beauty and wonder that we all once experienced when it came to these games. Or even these cards. So, what's the appeal of nostalgia? It lets us be a kid again. Even for a second.